Energy Transition Rangers. Our powers assemble. I'm solar power, harnessing the power of the sun. I'm water power, harnessing the power of hydroelectricity. And I'm wind power, using moving air to bring power to the people. Hey guys, it's me, I'm nuclear, can I... Uh, Can nuclear. I join you guys? I'm, I, I'm, I'm a futuristic energy source. I'm ready You're for large scale. The... Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I shit Ugh. my pants. Oh, oh. Nuclear waste. Can one of you guys hold on to this indefinitely for me? No, they, we're busy. We don't. I can't hold on to your waste indefinitely. Uh, can you just shut it off, please? Oh, oh, I'm doing it again. Oh, I shit again. Oh no, that's more. Ah, you're irradiating us with that oh. horrible, stinky nuclear ew. I just don't think we need you on the team, man. I think we should banish nuclear. No, don't banish me. I'm, oh, oh, I'm pooping again. Oh, I keep on pooping, guys. No, sorry, we gotta banish. Can you guys hold on to this indefinitely? Nuclear <laughs> energy, we banish you. Ah. Yeah, I don't know, I'm not like... I'm not like a dogmatist or whatever, it just doesn't, it just seems like we don't need him on the team. Yeah, if we couldn't do it on our own and we had like a really good way to deal with the waste Yeah, and if stuff, the technology like, was better, something, there was some sort of breakthrough or something, like I'm not... Yeah, if it, you know, like it could be, but it just it seems like we definitely don't need him and like, yeah. Stinky. Stinky. Stinky and harmful. Energy Transition Rangers! No Stinky Nuclear! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Seriously Wrong Podcast. It's the only podcast in the entire universe that's going to have 1,000 episodes and lead to 10,000 years of world peace. When we put that last piece, that last episode, episode 1,000, at the top of the sort of like almost like the Christmas tree of episodes or something, or like the House of Cards, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, Except one that won't fall. One like that will a stay. Jenga tower. Yeah, but like one that stays up forever. And you can only <laughs> think of metaphors. House of Cards or like and Jenga towers or, too, yeah. <laughs> uh, or like in the cat in the hat when he's balancing all the stuff on his feet and stuff. Right. Uh, except Maybe one it that could will... be built out of Lego. That's Lego strong stays. Strong Lego, yeah. yeah strong. Like, where you put glue on it and stuff. Or you could just leave it for a long time and the pieces will kind of get stuck together with age. Right, yeah, it settles into place. Yeah, kinda. it just kind of or like expands a little bit or it starts to melt into itself. I don't know. That's what I imagine. Anyway, that's what our show is like. And on that beautiful 1,000th episode, bing, 10,000 years of world peace around the world. Bing. And that's our guarantee. And that's all thanks to our generous patrons. So thank you to people who donate to us on Patreon to get bonus episodes, access to our Discord server, etc. Massively appreciated as usual. And if you haven't done it yet, hey, why not today? Today might be the, the day to hop in and support independent leftist content. We can't do it without you. And with your help, we're able to do more and better episodes, get people to help us in making the show, get great guests and so on like we have today. Yeah, so that's uh, patreon.com slash seriously wrong. Thanks again. If you're already doing that from the bottom of our heart, it makes all the difference in the world. Link in the description. So welcome to the show, everybody. We are your hosts. I am Aaron, and that's Sean. And we have a wonderful interview for you today with Mark Z. Jacobson, who's going to be laying out a transition plan away from using combustible fossil fuels to 100% renewables why it's important to do that, how we do it, how it's possible. And yeah, it's a great interview. And really excited to share that with you. But because it is the year of anger on Seriously Wrong, at least sort of some of the time, the year of anger, you know, grr, 
I'm angry. That's our slogan this year. I thought we should we should just talk a little bit about why the climate crisis makes us angry. Because I don't know, like in day to day life, you don't always tap into that of like what makes you angry about the climate crisis. But if you think about it, there's some like really good reasons to be angry. Yeah, I mean, natural disasters and major climate events are like a constant thing. But yeah, I, when I think about like what makes me angry people dying and the environment going to shit is like top of the list. The idea of like the real human and environmental costs of this stuff, droughts, wildfires, climate events, floods. Yeah, I mean, there's like kids who are growing up without their parents because of like landslides or flooding or towns being burned down. It like happened in Lytton here in BC a couple years back. And like, that's not just this passive, sad thing that happens out in the world. It's like the result of policy decisions made by the oil and gas industry over the last 70 years. Tons of documents have come out over the last 10 years showing the deep degree that the oil and gas industry knew about the impacts of combustible fuels on the climate. And there's a document from Shell Oil. There's an internal document from like 1998 where they refer to in the future people finding out that they knew all along and class action lawsuits coming in the 2010s as a result of them knowing about the impacts of climate change. So like not only do they know all along, but they knew that we we're going to figure out that they knew all along, all along. <laughs> right. And then also the oil and gas industry corrupts our politics. So like is an insane return on investment that they get for every dollar of lobbying that they spend. They get like tons of money in subsidies and shit like that. Politicians are captured by the oil and gas industry. Environmental legislation is shaped by oil and gas companies to increase their profits. So all these impacts on people's lives that we're talking about are the result of policy decisions made by a corrupt, out of control industry that is like living like kings by distorting our politics. And intentionally, there's also like they participated in spreading disinformation. It's like the tobacco industry thing too. like the tobacco industry found out it was causing cancer. And so they spent tons of money to try to convince people that it wasn't causing cancer or that it wasn't clear whether it was causing cancer so they could make more money for as long as possible. And the oil industry did that about the burning of fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess it's one thing if you're accidentally <laughs> destroying the environment, like, oh, whoops, like, we didn't know, like, we genuinely thought we were doing a good thing here, just getting power to the people. We wanted to get fuel into tanks and, you know, move society forward. But then, yeah, seeing documents where they're saying like, oh, yeah, all our scientists are telling us that this is going to really mess up the environment. You know, people are going to die from this and they're going to blame us for it because we know about it and we know we know about it. Our documents say we know about it, but there is still a lot of profit to be made between then and now. It's probably not going to, you know, really start affecting people for a few decades. So maybe we should just keep going. Yeah, it is pretty. It's pretty enraging. Yeah, it's like there's been a series of choices made over the decades where like they looked at an innocent child's face and then they looked at piles of money and they're like, yeah, kill him. That is the emotional story of the oil and gas industry's relation to climate science. It's like they made that decision repeatedly over and over again. And these are people who have private jets, they have yachts, they have mansions, they're richer than your wildest dreams. They're building bunkers so that their kids aren't the ones that die. Maybe their kids' kids will be because the bunkers are all run out of material or whatever. But, you know, they're not thinking that far ahead. It's really, like, gross, the selfishness of that. Yeah, and it's not even just, like, making money at the expense of harming people. It's also, like, because of the efforts to spread misinformation to protect their profits – they are like driving social wedges in communities. Like every time you've been at a Thanksgiving dinner and argued with your uncle about climate change or whatever like that, it's their fault that he's that misled and he's that aggressive. There's an alternate universe where they did the right thing, where our relationships with those people who are on the other side of this divide is repaired as compared to now. So they put space in communities and like, there's layers to how twisted this shit is. It's causing death. It's making money by destroying and torturing the planet. They're lying about it. And they're also just harming social relationships by having people in the world who are badly misled about what's happening. And it makes it so we can't collaborate towards solutions as a result of their work. So it really is enraging. Yeah, it's kind of like tricking people into doing your like dirty work for it. I mean, just thinking about the divisions within families and communities and whatever, like 
turning all these people into their little PR engines out there in the public, like defending the oil and gas industry's honor of like, no, they really, they're trying to do the right thing. Climate change isn't even real. Yeah, so we'll, we'll return to this theme later in the episode around climate anger and our thoughts on this, some of this stuff. But maybe it'll be good. We can start getting into our interview with Mark Jacobson, which is a lot more hopeful. It's focused on some of the, the things that we can do to fix some of these issues in the technological and social sphere. But yeah, without further ado, let's have a dose of hope with Mark C. Jacobson as he explains to us how an alternative energy system is possible, desirable, and within our grasp with existing technology. You want to roll the clip? Do I want to roll the clip? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's next to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess. You roll it over to me and I'll press play. <laughs> well, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. So, don't okay, want... don't roll the clip. Just play it. I just... I'm not trying to put you on the spot, man. It's just you're... Gotta Someone's got to roll it. And if yeah. you don't want to, I'm happy to. No, I'm happy to do it. I just... I just... I don't know. It's some, it's, I don't know what that just happened. That was a little weird of you, you I f- thought, but I don't know of you to be weird like that, but... I thought I was being normal, but maybe I'm just... I think I just got excited about you rolling it and I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I'm not trying to make it weird. <laughs> I'm sorry. I honor you. I'm, I, I, I honor you. I, oh, thank you. Yeah. I honor you too. Yeah. Oh, so thank here, you. I'll play, I'll play the clip. We'll just hit play. Let's play that clip. Smooth sailing. We'll play the clip. <laughs> so yeah. Hi. I really enjoyed reading your book. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. The book is No Miracles Needed, How Today's Technology Can Save Our Climate and Clean Our Air. So I wanted to ask you, what's wrong with our current energy system? And how does transitioning to a wind, water, and solar energy system help fix those problems? Well, our current energy system is dominated by combustion, combustion of fossil fuels and bioenergy. And that results in both air pollution, emissions of air pollutants that affect people's health, and greenhouse gases and particles that affect climate as well. And fossil fuels are limited resources and that affects energy insecurity over the long term. Air pollution causes seven and a half million deaths per year worldwide and causes over a billion, even up to two billion illnesses every year worldwide. So this is a problem that's dear to my heart that I want to solve or help solve, as is global warming. This last year, 2023, was the warmest record ever recorded by humans. It was about a half a degree Celsius above the temperature the previous year. And so the temperature last year was about one, almost 1. 1.5 degrees Celsius above the 1850 to 1900 baseline period. And it was a half a degree above the previous year alone. It's just the temperatures have skyrocketed and global warming is becoming worse and worse at a faster and faster pace. And this is a problem because of so many problems associated with higher temperatures on average worldwide, including not only higher sea levels, which would lead to coastal flooding, melting of ice, but heat stroke, heat stress that caused death and illness to hundreds of thousands of people, to even millions of people worldwide, loss of crops, famine, drought, floods, more extreme weather, more extreme hurricanes, higher air pollution, ocean acidification, and climate migration, which has even led to civil war in some cases. So these are two serious problems, air pollution and global warming, that are due to the burning of fuels. And energy insecurity is the third problem, which is not only the fact that fossil fuels are limited resources, they will run out at some point, resulting in instability, social instability, economic instability, political instability, but also we're importing a lot of energy. A lot of countries import a lot of energy from other countries. And so that means there can be supply disruptions. That's an energy insecurity problem. There's also the fact that, you know, you have to transport fuels in some cases over long distances to islands in the middle of the ocean, and that results in higher costs. So we want a solution that not only eliminates air pollutants and global warming pollutants, but also it eliminates or reduces significantly energy insecurity. If an island can produce all its own energy, it doesn't need to transport that energy. You can reduce costs quite a bit. If we don't have to rely on countries supplying fossil fuels across country borders over long distance, then that can reduce the reasons for some wars and instabilities. If we have fewer large scale power plants and more distributed energy, more just solar on rooftops, for example, and wind turbines that are spread apart, there's less risk that the whole power grid that 
a large city will go down in terms of its power availability when there's a problem with, let's say, a large coal-fired power plant. Also, if we have energy sources that are renewable, like wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric power, then we reduce or eliminate that energy insecurity problem of using limited resources. So the solution here is, in my mind, and we've been working on plans since 2009, to transition the world to 100% clean renewable energy and storage, namely wind, water, and solar. So we define that as not only generation of energy, well, first of all, we would electrify all energy. That means think of all energies in four major sectors. There's electricity, transportation, buildings, and industry. So for transportation, we would electrify that by going to battery electric vehicles for passenger vehicles and light duty vehicles, and even some large vehicles, including some short distance aircraft, short distance ships. And then we go to hydrogen fuel cell for long distance aircraft, long distance ships, and some long distance, large heavy transport. And then in industry, there's a lot of energy used right now to burn coal and gas and oil and bioenergy to produce high temperatures. So instead, we would use existing technologies that run on electricity called electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters, and even electric heat pumps. And for buildings, most energy right now, a lot of energy is used in the form of gas, natural gas, for heating air, heating water, cooking, and even clothes drying in some cases. So we replace that with electric heat pumps for air heating, water heating. Also, heat pumps are used for air conditioning. We use electric induction cooktops for cooking and even electric heat pump dryers. We go to LED lights, more energy efficiency in buildings. So we would electrify all energy, and then we provide the electricity with just wind, water, and solar. So that's onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and on power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal electricity, hydroelectricity, and maybe small amounts of tidal and wave electricity. And then there would be some solar heat and geothermal heat that would be direct heating. Now, we would need storage for such a system. We need electricity storage, heat storage, cold storage, and some hydrogen storage where hydrogen would be used not only for long distance vehicles, but also for steel production and ammonia production. So right now ammonia is made with hydrogen, but we would use hydrogen that is what we call green hydrogen to produce ammonia. It's green hydrogen when it's produced from clean, renewable wind, water, solar, electricity. So there are many types of electricity storage options already available. Hydroelectric dams are the biggest source of electricity storage today. Then there's pumped hydro storage where you have two reservoirs, a lower one and an upper one. When you have extra electricity, you pump water up a hill. When you need that electricity, you let water drain down a hill and run through a generator to generate electricity. Then there's batteries. There's also concentrated solar power is associated with storage. And then there are other types of storage that are upcoming, like flywheels. There's compressed air storage, gravitational storage with solid masses. These are all existing technologies. For heat storage, we would use water tanks mostly, like we do today, but also there's underground seasonal heat storage in soil, in water pits, in aquifers, and there's cold storage in water tanks and in ice. So, you know, this whole system, we would eliminate air pollution, we would eliminate global warming emissions, and we provide energy security. And there are many benefits, really just briefly, electrification and providing electricity with wind, water, and solar would reduce worldwide power demand by about 56% for five reasons. The efficiency of electric heat pumps over combustion heating, the efficiency of electric vehicles over internal combustion engine vehicles, the efficiency of electrified industry over combustion industry, eliminating all the energy needed to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. That's about 11% of all energy worldwide. We'd eliminate that energy need. And then end-use energy efficiency improvements beyond a business-as-usual case. That all adds up to about 56% reduction of demand without changing our habits. That means even if the cost per unit energy were the same in the two systems, annual costs that people pay would be about 56% lower. However, wind, water, solar is now cheaper than fossil fuels per unit energy. So we estimate that the overall annual energy costs are about 63% lower with just wind, water, solar. 
and the energy plus health plus climate costs are about 90 to 92 percent lower with wind water solar wow we create more jobs use less land it's really not much we can complain about this new system that's incredible because i mean one of the big issues from my understanding in transitioning from fossil fuels to these electric energy systems is you look at the graph of where all of our energy is coming from right now and so much of it is fossil fuels and the question is how can we ever replace that at the current rate so it's more than twice as efficient because of all these little savings adding up in different places is what you're saying when we switch to an electric system we actually have to use less than half the total amount of energy we currently do wow i mean think about it this way if let's say right now we're using 100 units of energy for all purposes about 20% of that or 20 units is for electricity and the rest is for transportation fuels, industry, et cetera. If we go to a wind, water, solar, electric system, our total energy demand goes down from 100 units to 44 units. But almost all those 44 units are now electricity. So our electricity demand doubles or a little more than doubles from 20 units to 44 units. But our overall energy demand goes down from 100 units to 44 units so by 56%. More electricity, less overall energy. Yeah, that's incredible. One of the big political issues that I've faced in talking about this, I've had a bunch of conversations about a wind, water, solar plan with people. And I find that sometimes people are just like, nah, that's not possible. And I'm like, oh, there's this whole thing you can read. There's this big report. You can, <laughs> at the very least, some people think this is possible. So I'm curious, what convinced you that this is possible. How did you come to this conclusion that wind, water, solar, and renewable energy uh, is an answer to these problems? You know, I assume that a lot of people are going to agree this is desirable, but they've got some lingering cynicism or doubts or a sense of hopelessness about this stuff. Well, our first plan was in 2009, and it was a world plan that did not look at individual countries. It was looking at worldwide numbers. You know, do we have enough renewable energy resources in terms of solar? Is there enough solar? Is there enough wind? Is there enough hydro, geothermal? So the first finding was, yeah, there's enough solar to power the whole world over 3,000 times over for all purposes, for example. Now, not necessarily in places that are close by, but we don't need that much. We need one 3,000th of the total available. You know, there's enough wind to power the whole world about eight times over. Now, hydro is not going to grow much more than currently, and geothermal won't grow a huge amount. But there is a lot of geothermal deep down, but it's pretty expensive to get there. So it's mostly going to be wind and solar. And then, you know, the other question is, well, okay, if we did want to power the world with just wind and solar, how much land would that take? And, you know, certainly there's offshore wind, which doesn't take up new land. There's rooftop solar, which doesn't take up new land. But when you look at the amount of land that we would need, if we just did power with wind and solar, it's not a huge amount of land, especially when we look at it in more detail, like we've done worldwide in individual countries. Like in the United States, right now, the fossil fuel industry occupies about 1.3% of all United States land area. And you know there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year. There are 1.3 million active ones and 3.2 million abandoned oil and gas wells in the United States alone. So if we transition to wind, water, solar, we'd be using actually about 1% or less of the land. So we'd actually reduce land requirements and we wouldn't be building 50,000 new oil and gas wells every year. So we would eliminate that growth because once you have a wind, water, solar system up, you don't need to dig for fuel anymore, right? And so the, the fuel is coming to the wind turbines, the solar panels directly. So you don't need to dig for fuel. So you don't have that land requirement. You don't have that cost either. Wind is free. Solar is free. That's why the whole thing is going to be much cheaper is because we're using free fuels. Now, you do need some growth over time because population grows, but that's much less growth of land use than when you have to dig for fuels every day for eternity. It's just not sustainable. So in 2009, we developed this plan for the world and said, yeah, it's feasible to do from a, not only from a resource point of view, a land point of view, but we also looked at costs from a cost point of view. And we had done a little bit of studies on reliability, not obviously not in detail, but the conclusion was, yeah, it's technically and economically possible to transition the world to 100% wind, water, solar for all purposes. And even by 2030, it's technically and economically possible. But for social and political reasons, that probably wouldn't happen until maybe 2050. So a good goal would be like 80% by 2030, 100% by 2050. But we did say it's, it is possible by 2030. And that turned out to be this paper, which was published in Scientific American in 2009, turned out to be the scientific basis for what's called the Green New Deal, which is a policy proposal initiated in the United States to transition the country to 100% renewable energy by 2030. 
Now, this plan, though, you know, people thought, oh, it's just pie in the sky. This is just theoretical. This will never work. You know, a worldwide plan is, you know, nobody's controlling the whole world. Nobody can implement policy on a worldwide scale. So we had to look at, you know, find a resolution. So we started a plan for the whole United States in 2011 that we found the same result. Uh, but then we looked at individual states. We started with New York. Then we went to California, did Washington state. Then we did all 50 United States. And we found, yeah, we can transition all 50 United States to wind, water, solar. And that actually took off from policy's perspective. These state plans were implemented quite a bit in the United States. In the 2016 election, for example, for president, all three Democratic candidates actually adopted our 100% renewables plan as part of their platform. And the whole Democratic platform adopted 100% renewables. Ultimately, as of now, 18 states, then Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C., have adopted 100% renewable laws in the electric power sector, or effectively 100% renewables. So this and these laws, and, and there's some of them are executive orders, were originated from our energy plan. So that was a great policy win to actually have science-based plans that implemented into policy. And then, as I mentioned, they were the science basis of the Green New Deal, which was a federal proposal that never got voted on. But there have been eight laws and resolutions introduced into the United States Congress, House and Senate, are calling for 100% renewables based on these plans, but none has ever been voted on. In the meantime, in 2017, we then developed plans at first for 139 countries of the world, and that got expanded to 143 countries in 2019, then 145 countries in 2022, and now 149 countries this year, 2024. And these plans are very specific for individual countries. We find the same thing. We can transition every individual country we've checked. And we're limited by those countries because those are the countries for which the International Energy Agency has data available for all the energy sectors and fuel types that we can actually analyze. But we found we can do it everywhere. We can transition everywhere. And now 63, or 62 or 63 countries have policies or laws to transition to 100% renewables in the electric power sector. Only Denmark has policies to go to 100% in all energy sectors. Policies have been one you know, measure of the usefulness of these plans. But even more important, there are actually now, if we look at data, there are actually many countries and U.S. states that have gone a long way toward transitioning toward 100% renewables. There are now like five countries in the world that are at 100% wind, water, solar, and their electricity generation in the annual average. And like Albania, that's mostly hydro. And all these countries are dominated by hydro. Iceland is one that is mostly hydro, but also has a lot of geothermal and wind. And Norway is pretty close. They have a lot of hydro too and wind. There's Paraguay, there's Uruguay. And, and there are 10 countries that are 97.5% to 100% wind, water, solar. Bhutan, Nepal, even Tajikistan is way up there, again, dominated by hydropower. And there are 45 countries that are at 50% to 100% wind, water, solar in their electric power generation. In the United States, there are 11 states that generate between 50 and 100% of the electricity that they consume effectively from wind, water, solar. Starting with South Dakota is about 96%, Iowa is close to you know, 90%. And those are dominated by wind. In fact, there are seven states that generate 50 to 80 or 90% of the electricity that they consume from just wind alone. And these states, by the way, the electricity cost in those states is below the US average. So here's an example where high penetrations of wind, water, solar, in this case, particularly wind, have shown that that keeps the cost of electricity down. You know, some people complain about renewables, oh, it's just going to drive the prices up. But that statement is belied by the fact that there are seven states that generate 50 to 90% of the electricity just from wind alone, the electricity that they consume from wind alone that have lower than average US electricity prices. So in reality, wind, water, solar is being implemented, but we have a long way to go. Worldwide, we're only like 10% of the way there compared to, you know, for all energy sectors to transition. So we still have to solve 90% of the problem. But China, for example, is the biggest country in terms of energy consumption and CO2 emissions. But it has actually installed huge amounts of wind and solar and even hydropower in the last few years. And it's, it is doing a lot to go further. And so even this coming year, there'll be more huge installations coming in China 
along with many other countries of the world. We're at war. War with the oil profiteers and planet torturers. War with the PR firms and professional liars who cut open our communities to bleed us out for profit. We're at war with the combustion fuels that give kids asthma. Greenwashing executives who spend more on green oil advertising than low carbon projects. We're at war with the politicians who take money from oil and gas for their campaigns and repay them generously with subsidies and handouts from the public purse. We're at war with the people who live like kings while they burn the planet and poison our children for profit. My name is Felix Bones, your spooky conductor, and this is Narrative Wars, because there's a war on for your story. All right, folks, here at the top of the hour, we're going over the evidence that the oil and gas industry knew what they were doing as early as 70 years ago today. We have the documents, but first up, a word from our sponsor. This episode of Felix Bones Narrative Wars is brought to you by Crank Brain Wisdom Supplements. Get cranked up and have the brain of a crank to focus on crank-like details of public policy with our patented mixture of organic and all-natural brain compounds that make you obsessive and detail-oriented about the things that really matter, like climate change, public transit, poverty, and corruption. Now, it won't grow your amount of Twitter followers, but it will grow the clarity that you have in your mind. I've been taking Crank Brain Wisdom Pills every day this year, and my ability to zero in on seemingly niche details to obsessively build a personalized and esoteric understanding has gone through the roof. I've been writing almost daily letters to my congressman, my mayor, and the president, and I'm talking eight, nine page letters with extensive citations personalized to their office every day this year. That's Crank Brain Wisdom Supplements in a nutshell. Use the promo code GETCRANKED to get 10% off your order in the Narrative Wars store. All right, folks, so we're talking about the ways in which the fossil fuel industry knew about climate change early and worked to mislead the public to protect their profits. It is anger year on Narrative Wars, and it's time to get angry about what they're doing to our world and our children for money to enrich themselves at our expense. In July of 1977, a top climate scientist at Exxon internally informed the company there is a general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. He followed up in 1978, a doubling of CO2 gases in the atmosphere would increase the global temperatures by another two or three degrees, a number that is consistent with the scientific consensus today. The oil and gas industry was aware of this information, was also aware that it could affect their profitability. So they pursued a strategy of obfuscation, denial, and increasing fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the public sphere, spending millions of dollars to create false narratives in public perceptions about climate change to slow the fight against climate change so they can make more money by bleeding out our children, coming into our homes, and dragging them kicking and screaming into the street. In 1988, NASA scientist James Hansen told the U.S. Congress that the planet was already warming, and despite being warned internally by their scientists for decades, Exxon at the time claimed the science was still uncertain. They spent billions of dollars trying to muddy the waters of public opinion. A 1998 memo written by the American Petroleum Institute, an association of oil companies including BP, ExxonMobil, and Shell titled Global Climate Science Communications Plan, contained a quote about this strategy, victory will be achieved when the average citizens and the media are convinced of uncertainties in climate science. Now, it's not that they believe there was uncertainties, it's that they knew there were not uncertainties and that there was money to be made by lying to the people, dividing their communities, and dragging families, kicking and screaming, into the street for profit. It even came out earlier this year. It goes back further than the 1970s. In the mid-1950s, an air pollution research group funded by the oil industry and car manufacturers funded a study into CO2 and climate change that found that CO2 emissions from fossil fuels will have planetary impacts, marking the earliest known time at present that the fossil fuel industry was unambiguously told about the potentially deeply damaging impacts of fossil fuel combustion. That is 70 years ago. More than twice my lifetime as Felix Bones. They have known this, and they have worked to mislead the public. A 1988 internal memo from Shell on the greenhouse effect revealed that Shell started funding internal research into the greenhouse effect of oil as early as 1981, and a 1998 internal memo predicted that class action lawsuits would start in the 2010s based on the oil and gas industry knowing about this stuff and working to hide it. In 2021, a senior Exxon lobbyist was caught on tape confessing to the strategy. Did we aggressively fight against some of the science? Yes, said Keith McCoy. 
Did we join some of these shadow groups to work against some of the early efforts to fight climate change? Yes, that is true. But there is nothing illegal about that, he said. You know, we were looking out for our investments. We were looking out for our shareholders. Talk about saying the quiet part out loud. Of course, Exxon Mobil chief executive Darren Woods lied through his teeth about the incident, saying we were shocked by these interviews and stand by our commitments to work on finding solutions to climate change. Yes, we all believe you, Darren. You are so convincing to us. And you seem like such a good guy. Why don't you come to Felix Bones' barbecue, Darren, chief executive of Exxon Mobil? You're a climate change fighter, aren't you? Oh, you're basically a, a goddamn activist, aren't you? You were shocked by that? You found it shocking what he confessed to, but your strategy has been for 70 years? Yeah, that must have been real shocking for you, Darren. Do they keep you in a box, Darren? Do they bury you underground so you can't hear or see anything that happens in your company, Darren? Darren, you don't know that a 2019 report on top oil and gas companies found that they were spending $200 million a year on PR for social media, greenwashing their efforts while still spending 97% of their operating budget on high carbon projects in a climate crisis? That's news to you, Darren? Are you shocked to hear that, Darren? Are you going to come out of the box and help us join Greta in the streets? Go fuck yourself, Darren Woods. Next up, we've got a very special guest. His name is Jiminy Jam Jam, and he is an expert in the ways that the oil and gas industry corrupts our politics. And I'll just turn over the camera pan. He's been sitting here for a little while listening to me. Sorry, you've got a little bit of my spit on your face. Here's a napkin to wipe it off. It's, and the napkins, the Narrative Wars napkins are available in the store. If you use the coupon code SPITTLE, you can get 10% off. It's the only napkins that will protect you from the Illuminati brain race. Uh, and it's an absorbent napkin. It's a nice, thick, plush napkin. Feels soft against your skin. I 100% wouldn't, organic as well. I wouldn't clean spittle off with anything else. Thank, well, thank you, you so much. It's always a pleasure. It's always an honor. And may I just say a that planner. crank brain wisdom pills, I've been taking them too. And whoo. The focus, it's like nothing. It's, uh, it's I've quadrupled my work output. It's a planner to take them, which is a pleasure honor. And it's a planner to have you here. Well, it's a planner to hear you say that. So thinking about how the oil and gas industry corrupts our politics is really an enraging topic. I think you'll be enraged by what I have to say, and I think your audience will be enraged by it as well. Well, good. Did you know that between 1995 and 2005, the oil and gas industry spent $2.9 billion on advocacy and advertising to mislead the public on climate change and $1.3 billion to shape public policy? That's more money than I've ever seen in my life. It's a lot of money. It boggles the mind, actually. like thinking about that, thinking about like four and a half billion dollars spent in those 10 years. And it's only gotten worse since then. According to Oil Change International, for every dollar the oil and gas industry spends on lobbying politicians in America, they see $59 back in direct subsidies. But that stat is actually from 2009 to 2010. So I, when I was looking at this with my crank brain wisdom pills in there, I wanted to see what the current numbers were like. So I looked it up in 2022. They spent $124 million on lobbying in the United States and in return got $18.4 billion in direct federal spending going to the industry, which is actually a return of $148 for every dollar spent. Or another way of putting that is 14,800% return on investment for those dollars spent in lobbying. That's called rent seeking. It's where an industry will donate to politicians and in exchange they get favorable treatment and regulations, handouts, subsidies, and so on. So if you spend $100 helping politicians get elected, you're repaid by policy that puts money from the public purse into your coffers as private industry. Yeah, I, I want to emphasize, though, these numbers I've been talking about are direct federal spending given to the oil and gas industry. The, those numbers, that percentage actually increases drastically when you include preferential oil and gas, lease royalty rates, specialty tax preferences, research and development aid, loan guarantees tax incentives, that kind of thing. When you do that, the oil and gas industry in 2023 actually received not $18.4 in federal spending, but about $757 billion 
in various incentives, subsidies, et cetera, all those things I listed. So if you think about it in terms of all the return on investment they're getting, it's actually closer to $6,000 for every dollar spent on lobbying. Wow, what a beneficial arrangement for the demons who are poisoning and destroying our world. Imagine if you donated $10 to your local politician, and then after they were elected, they gave you $60,000 in benefit. I would love that, honestly. I would love that, too. That would make me so rich but so that's fast. A, that's a deal that uh, doesn't get given to the little guys like us, Felix. That's a deal reserved only for oil and gas industry or other major billionaires and people like that. And if you're a little guy, go to the Narrative War store to get big boy bulkening pills. Now, this is a patented formula that will increase your body size by up to 5 to 10%. Add it to your stack to grow up. Now, we are the little guys. We are not the big oil and gas industry, but there's no reason we can't grow with supplements from the Narrative War store. Use the coupon code LITTLEBABYNARRATIVEBOY to get 10% off. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives found that between 2011 and 2018, records showed that the oil and gas lobby met with Canadian politicians 11,452 times to advocate for their policies and priorities, which is the most lobbying of any sector during the period, totaling about six contacts per day. So if you think about, you know, what your politicians are spending their time on, what they're doing, uh, just know that, you know, 11,000... 452 times, 452 meetings in those seven years. That's a lot, a lot of influence, a lot of meetings, a lot of time spent given to these people. I remember this document. In the years between 2000 and 2018, oil production increased in Canada by 80%, while taxes on oil producers went down by half and royalties down by 63%. That lobbying really paid off. The report concluded that there is an elite policy network that extends between both right-wing and center-left governments between elections where long-term relationships are built between state power and corporate power, influencing policy without democratic oversight. Well, that's what we've been saying on the show for a long time. I'm so glad the mainstream media is finally, finally coming around yeah, on it. Yeah, we've, you've had the documents for years and you've been saying it for years. But I think another aspect of this that sometimes gets under discussed is that, you know, all these things we've been talking about are technically legal. Lobbying is legal. Subsidies are legal. Having tons of meetings with oil and gas industry professionals from politicians, it's all legal. But the oil and gas industry, we do know, are also doing illegal things behind the curtain. The panel peanut bribery scandal, it started with a complaint filed with the SEC alleging that between 2002 and 2007, panel peanut incorporated bribed government officials in multiple countries. Bribes totaling at least $49 million to countries in Angola, Brazil, Russia, Nigeria, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. Panalpina is a shipping company who did these bribes on behalf of customers. Their major customers include at least six major oil companies and their subsidiaries like Royal Dutch Shell Incorporated, Pride International, Tidewater, Transocean, Global Santa Fe, etc. The purpose of these bribes were to circumvent local rules and import regulations to gain preferential treatment to expedite the importation of goods and equipment, obtain lower tax estimates, and also allowed them to extend drilling contract and obtain false paperwork related to offshore drilling rigs. And that's just the bribery that we know about. I would assume that there is probably millions, billions, maybe perhaps more of bribery that's been going on at the same time and ever since that. This is one little window we caught because they got caught and they had to admit it and they had to pay some fines to get that back, not enough fines, but this is how these people operate. They do what they want with impunity, destroying the planet for their own benefit. And this all has real effects on the people, folk. You know, we're having major climate events. 2023 was the hottest year on record. We've had record hot months, month after month, for something like 14 or 15 months now. We have wildfires, floods, landslides, storms and hurricanes, taking people's lives and livelihoods away from them, droughts which threaten access to drinking water and stable access to food, all for the profits of a small group of oil and gas companies who do not care about us. They would sooner see us die than sacrifice even a small amount of their profits. And they have the gall to look us in the eye, smile, and say, we're working on green energy. We're going to lead the climate transition. If that doesn't make you angry, folks, I don't know what will. As we were working on this episode, Shell announced on March 14th, 2024, 
that they're going to be backtracking on an earlier pledge to reduce carbon emissions by 45% by 2035, citing uncertainty in the transition to renewables. So all of that ink was wasted on all those press releases about what good guys they are and how much they deserve to be patted on the back because they just rolled it right on back while we weren't paying attention right under our noses. This has been Felix Bone's Narrative Wars because there's a war on for your story and get angry, folks. Once you know what to do, the next step is to get angry. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks to our guest. Thank you, Felix. And may Mother Gaia rise up and pull down the captains of industry into the earth. Talk to you next time. A lot of the time when I've talked about this in public and talk with people, the most consistent thing, and I don't know if it's an internet thing, it seems to be a recent thing over the last couple of years that you see more and more of it, is that there's some very strong nuclear advocates. In your book, you've got a chapter on nuclear and what you think the limits of nuclear are. Can you sort of compare and contrast nuclear versus the wind, water, solar plan and, and why you think the wind, water, solar is superior? Yeah, there are basically seven reasons why nuclear going forward is not helpful. And two are kind of practical and economic, and the rest are energy security problems. Even if energy security is not an issue, it's just the delay, the time it takes for a new reactor. Well, let me break this up. You have conventional reactors, which are large ones. There's new conventional reactors and their existing ones. And then there are what we call small modular nuclear reactors that are being proposed going forward as well. So in terms of like new large conventional reactors and liberalized markets, like in Europe and the United States, for example, they're taking between 17 and 21 years between planning and operation. In the United States, only two reactors have been installed in the last 20 years and both at the same location in Georgia. And they've taken 17 to 18 years each between planning and operation. And they cost $35 billion dollars for a total between the two of them of about 2.3 gigawatts. So it's on the order of almost $16 a watt. And that compares with $1 a watt for new onshore wind or solar utility scale solar. And so it's 16 times the capital cost and for new wind or solar, well, rooftop solar can take like six months. You can put it on six months, but utility scale is like one to three years. We're talking on the order of 15 to 17 years longer and the 16 times the capital cost. And even if you look at the levelized cost of energy, which is when you account for the, not only the capital cost, but the operation and maintenance costs, the fuel costs, and the actual output of electricity, the cost of energy for nuclear, new nuclear is about five to eight times that of new onshore wind or utility scale solar. So it costs much more and it takes much longer to implement. So due to the high air pollution death rates that are occurring today and the high temperatures, we need to solve 80% of the problem, the climate and pollution problems we face by 2030. So that's six years away and 100% by 2035 to 2050. So if you have a technology that's when it starts today, won't be ready till 2041, which is 17 years from now, that is not helpful at all for solving the climate crisis or the air pollution crisis or energy security crises we face. And so it's just not helpful and it's useless, in fact. Okay, on top of that, you have these other energy security issues. One is the nuclear weapons proliferation. About five countries of the world have developed nuclear weapons secretly under the guise of civilian nuclear energy or research reactor programs. And there are only around 30 or so countries that have nuclear energy. So one sixth of them have actually developed weapons secretly. And so if we want to spread nuclear energy to other countries, you know, there's a good chance that some of them will try to develop weapons. Then there's meltdown risk. There have been about six reactors that have seriously melted down, and there's some others that have melted down to lesser degrees, but six out of 400 reactors in the world is around 1.5% failure rate. So one and a half percent of all reactors ever built have, or ever have been running on a sustained scale have melted down to some degree. Then there's waste. What do you do with the waste? You have to store it for 200,000 to 300,000 years. And right now, like in the United States, the waste is stored on site at each reactor. And there's really not an answer to that, but it takes a lot of energy to maintain that waste also for that long period of time. And then there's underground uranium mining. Historically, about 10% of underground uranium miners have died of lung cancer because 
Uranium, it's one of its decay products is radon. Radon is a gas that the radon will convert to polonium. Polonium gets into people's systems and, and is a carcinogen and contributes to lung cancer. And then there's carbon emission. So people say, well, nuclear is carbon free, but it's not. Uh, not only is there a lot of carbon, half the carbon is emitted by the fact that it takes so long to build a nuclear reactor and plant it compared with wind or solar. So if it's taking, let's say, two years to build a solar plant and 17 years to build a nuclear reactor, that's a 15-year difference. And so during that 15 years, you're emitting a lot of carbon from coal plants and gas plants. That has to be accounted for. Then there's all the carbon from the construction of the nuclear plant. Like the Vogel plants, there was enough cement put in these plants for a sidewalk between Miami and Seattle. And all that carbon emissions was emitted before a single kilowatt hour of electricity was generated. So there's this backup of carbon emissions from the construction. There's all the carbon emissions from the delays. Then you also have to mine and refine uranium. And that's a very energy intensive process. There's carbon emissions there. Then the actual power plants themselves, they emit heat and water vapor. The heat is just a radioactive decay product, direct heat to the atmosphere, and water vapor do because you need cooling water to cool the reactors, and that results in water evaporation. Water That's a greenhouse gas. So when you add up all these emissions, it's about nine to 37 times the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions as new wind, which is less than gas, but it's still not trivial. It's pretty actually pretty large. So you have these additional problems in addition to the delays and the high costs. And so this is why we don't use large new nuclear reactors. We don't propose to use those. Same thing with small modular reactors. They have the same issues as the large ones. They may even be more expensive because initially before large reactors were built, we were trying to build small ones, but we went to large ones due to economies of scale because it's cheaper to build bigger reactors. So now they're trying to go to smaller reactors. So there's more material per unit energy output required can result in higher costs. And the delays seem to be the same. You know, there are initially proposals to have some new reactors available by 2030, but even those have been delayed in like the company that's the furthest along, which is called New Scale in small modular reactors. They actually had a design approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Their largest purchaser bailed out because of high costs. And high costs in general have also resulted in them laying off half their workforce. And there's no clear path for them to actually develop a nuclear reactor that's even testable by 2030 at this point. You know, and these other companies, they're not as far along. So we don't, we have no idea how long it'll take to actually develop a test reactor, let alone a commercial one. But we need 80% of the problem solved by 2030 when they can't even guarantee not even a test reactor by 2030. It's just not worth spending time trying to on this going forward. We need to just deploy, deploy, deploy technologies that work right away at low cost. And the costs of these new reactors, as I said, are probably going to be the same or higher than the large reactors. They have many of the same energy security problems. Weapons proliferation is even worse because now you have small reactors that can be shipped around the world. More countries would have access to nuclear materials. Meltdown risk, we don't know. Some designs may have less, but others may have more meltdown risk. Some say that they there's less waste because they refine their uranium more, but in that case, then it's more weapons proliferation risk because you have higher refined uranium. And anyway, there's still going to be storage risk, waste storage that will have to be had for most of these designs. And you still have these carbon emissions due to delays and obtaining uranium, et cetera. So there's Nothing to be said about these small reactors that gives me confidence that uh, these are actually useful for anything whatsoever. Um, existing reactors, I'd say, as long as they don't have to be subsidized, we can keep them um, until they naturally retire. But subsidizing is not a good path forward, existing reactors, because that subsidy money could be used to replace these reactors with clean renewable energy, which you're going to have to do in any case. So why waste additional subsidy money just to keep the reactors open when that subsidy money itself could be used to actually build new replacements right now. We now go to a public men's washroom. Oh, oh I gotta pee, gotta pee, gotta pee. Uh, uh, get out to the urinal here. Uh, oh, yeah. Whew. That's nice. <laughs> hey, partner. 
Oh, hey, yeah, you know, there's lots of there's lots of open ones down there. Oh, you there. don't want it's me like, to use the urinal right next to you? I mean, I, I guess well, you can. I'm it's sorry, just, I, I already got a flow going. I, I well, can't move now. Uh, yeah. I'm not looking or anything. It's it's all good. No, yeah, it's just not what people normally do. But hey, you know what? I thought of it as like filling up the urinal. So, you know, you were in the furthest one. and right. the, Yeah, so I'm moving towards the... So yeah, I just took the furthest one from the door thinking, you know, someone else... Co- it does, yeah, it doesn't and I took the second furthest one from the door because I was thinking, like, we'd sequentially fill up all the urinals. Right, yeah, if there's a big rush. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it looks like we're in the clear, but the just in case, it, that's just where my mind went. Hey, but did you know that um, fully converting human energy use to nuclear with single-pass reactors is completely impossible? No, I thought nuclear, wasn't that actually like one of the better ways to get us out of using fossil fuels? I thought that nuclear was nope. like pretty... No, it turns out no. Yeah, no, I just read this book, this Mark Z. Jacobson book, No Miracles Needed. Actually, part of the reason I have to pee so bad and I'm peeing so long is because I was holding in the pee as I finished reading this chapter because uh, I was so engrossed in it. Right, yeah, we've all been there. But yeah, uranium reserves that were known about as of 2019 only have enough fuel to last our current single-pass reactors around the world for 147 years with the current capacity. So growing nuclear power would deplete those reserves faster. I mean, 147 isn't that many years in, in you know the long run of human history, obviously. Right, and not a lot of our energy is currently coming from new. Like, if we tried to transition to nuclear, we would be building tons of new plants that would drastically decrease those remaining years. Yeah, yeah. so if we wanted to use 100% nuclear energy for all of our energy needs, we'd need about 9 trillion watts, which would require about 12,500, 850 megawatt nuclear reactors, which is... About 31 times the amount which are in existence today. So that means we'd have to make one nuclear plant per day, every day for the next 34 years. And it takes decades for a nuclear reactor to come online. But even if we could do that, let's just say that we could get it all done very quickly and set them all up today. And we didn't have to, you know, one of the issues too is that when you're setting up the nuclear reactors, you need to use fossil fuels in the meantime. That's one of the reasons that wind, water, and solar is good is a lot of it's deployable in a much faster way so we can start transitioning more energy away from combustion fuels but even if we were able to close the gap on the 12,500 850 megawatt nuclear reactors that would mean that all known uranium reserves would be depleted within three years so it's just like as far as single pass reactors go it is just totally impossible to convert to an entirely nuclear energy system wow no that's uh that's fascinating i didn't uh, 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 yeah there we go and i'm I'm done peeing. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, I didn't know that. Oh, I'm done peeing. Hey, well, let's go wash our hands. I mean, you wash your hands after you pee, right? Oh, of course, yeah. Especially if someone else is in the bathroom with me. Uh, do you mind if I wash my hands on the sink right next to you so I could share just a few more facts about nuclear power? Yeah, normally I would be like, oh, why are you going right next to me if there's space? But yeah, these, these facts have been blowing my mind, so keep them coming. So another issue, and you know, pro-nuclear advocates will often downplay this because it's a very sort of, quote, Al Gore, an inconvenient truth, I guess. Not that I'm, a, I mean, I have my issues with Gore, but he was right on that, we can all say. Right. Every country with nuclear capabilities increases nuclear weapons proliferation risk, which is really serious. You know, in the world, there's 30 nuclear countries. Six of them have engaged in secret weapons programs under the pretense of civilian energy infrastructure. So it's a really high percentage of, so if you put nuclear plants all around the world and you keep that ratio, you're talking about a massive amount of nuclear weapons being created. Tons of secret nuclear programs. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, there would be a big overlap. That's the perfect cover, really. So yeah, and if we want to be serious about evaluating the, the climate impacts of nuclear energy, we have to factor in the ecological impacts of a potentially devastating nuclear bomb detonation. You know, uh, first of all, two to 16 million people could be killed by a 15 kiloton bomb which is bad enough, you know, people, human lives obviously have value, uh, you know, one, per, one life is valuable, let alone 16 million. But a bomb that's detonated could burn between 63 and 313 million tons of city infrastructure, adding 5 million tons of warming and cooling aerosols to the atmosphere and emitting between 92 and 690 million tons of carbon dioxide. So when we're calculating the carbon impacts of nuclear power, we have to consider that in the high-end possibilities and estimates. The low end for this would be that there'd be no nuclear bombs that go off, and fingers crossed that would be the case. But there's a very real possibility when you have six out of 30 nuclear countries having secret weapons programs that 
at some point in the future, there would be a detonation of bombs causing an enormous amount of carbon release and massive cost to human life. Oh, yeah. You always think about how horrifying nuclear bombs are because of the death and destruction of infrastructure. I hadn't even thought about the climate impacts of like carbon being emitted because of a nuclear bomb attack. That's... Uh, Oh, you've given me a lot to think about here. This has been a way more thoughtful trip to the bathroom than I typically have. Yeah, I mean, and let's see you kill 16 million people with a windmill. Now I'm just thinking about how to do that. It would be really hard. You'd have yeah, to I don't think you could spin do it. it really fast and put like razor blades on it Something and like, like that. put yeah. people on a conveyor belt so that the windmill chops the their heads off. It's much more challenging than a yeah, nuclear bomb. No, yeah. Yeah. It, you would need more than just a windmill. You would need a whole system of... Yeah, windmill-based death. Yeah, it would be, it's far-fetched, let me say. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, wind, water, solar power, it's possible and desirable, and they've done detailed analysis, they've got plans on how it could be done around the world, so I think it's, uh... And I mean solar panels, I mean, you could smash someone over the head with a solar panel, but not that yeah. many, they're pretty weak. Or like, you it could, wouldn't... It's kind of, you could use solar to make, have like an array of mirrors that point a hyper-hot ray of like right. solar energy at someone. But that's completely different than a panel. That's like... Yeah, and there's never, that's never been, you know, there's never been a, a civilian no infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Examples are of that, yeah. Civilian infrastructure, solar power, and we've got our secret solar death ray program coming right, out of it. Not right, that right. it's impossible, but it just hasn't yet happened. Yeah, I guess wind, water, and solar. All right. Well, I'm realizing now that I actually have to go pee a second time, but it was nice to talk to you. Uh, well, enjoy. Uh, yeah. Oh, someone else is coming in to use the urinal. Maybe uh, you can enlighten them as well. Hey, have a good one, man. See ya. I'll just unzip again and uh, let it flow. In addition to nuclear, I'm curious about solar radiation management. Something that's come up on the show is the spraying the particulates in the atmosphere as a way of dealing with climate change. And also carbon capture and storage is another really frequently touted solution. If you could speak briefly on those. Yeah, well, first, solar radiation management. So one of the proposals is let's spray particles in the stratosphere that are reflective of light to cool the surface, reduce the amount of sunlight getting to the surface. Now, that is not a solution to anything. That is what we call masking the problem. It doesn't, first of all, it doesn't do anything for air pollution because we're not actually addressing any emissions. So we continue with seven and a half million people dying in a, you know, one to two billion people becoming ill from air pollution every year. In fact, that goes up because some of those particles that are going to the stratosphere come down to the, toward the surface and 90% of the air pollution deaths are due to particles. But it also creates other risks and doesn't solve climate change. It all it does is reduce sunlight to the surface, which affects temperatures to some degree, but doesn't affect other aspects of climate change, including ocean acidification, where carbon dioxide that's still being emitted is dissolving in the ocean water and then destroying coral reefs because carbon dioxide is an acid, it goes to carbonic acid that destroys coral reefs and other ocean life. But you now have less sunlight coming to the surface. That means less photosynthesis. So less crop growth. So now that can lead, depending on the magnitudes, can lead to starvation, other problems in some parts of the world that are already close to subsistence levels. Let's say you get you know five percent less solar radiation to the surface, that will result in less crop growth for sure. So that's a side effect. You know the reason we have the ozone hole and the global stratospheric ozone reduction is because chemical reactions occur on the surfaces of particles. And especially when the ozone hole appears, it's because we get these ice crystals forming over the southern hemisphere near the South Pole region. It gets really cold and you get these ice crystals. And on the surface of those ice crystals, you have these chemical reactions involving chlorine and bromine that have been emitted since the 1930s. If by solar radiation management, you're putting in new particles that you don't even need to form polar stratospheric clouds. You actually have particles there year round now because of human injection of these particles. And on the surface of these particles, you can get ozone destruction. So that's a big risk about what would actually happen to the ozone layer. And if we do that, then people would become complacent. Oh, we don't have to solve the climate problem. So we even emit more. So this is not a solution. This is a horrible suggestion by runaway scientists to mask the problem and allow fossil fuels to continue. So other technologies that allow fossil fuels to continue are carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, and electrofuels. Those technologies are all designed by the fossil fuel industry to keep themselves going. So what are they? So carbon capture, 
is when you put a device, let's say in a coal-fired power plant or some other source of carbon dioxide and other pollutants, and the device will remove some of the carbon dioxide from the exhaust stream of, a, let's say, a coal-fired power plant. Now, it doesn't remove 100%. On average, worldwide, of all the carbon capture facilities, the removal rate is between 10 and 80% in the annual average. So not really efficient. In fact, on half the plants, it's less than 50% removal. But that's not the main problem. The main problem is, well, first of all, there's an energy penalty. It takes energy to do it. You need equipment and energy. And that energy penalty can be, it's on the average about 25% of the output. Let's say if you have a coal plant with carbon capture, it requires 25% of the electricity from the coal plant to run the carbon capture equipment. Now, just to give you an idea of how ridiculous this is, there was only one coal plant in the United States with carbon capture added to it. That was in Thompson, Texas. It's called the Petronova Project. And they added carbon capture to the coal plant. But to run the carbon capture plant, they actually built a natural gas plant right next door to the coal plant. And now they mined new natural gas. They had to transport that gas. There's leakage of methane. There's emissions of pollutants and other chemicals due to the mining of the gas. Leakage of methane due to the transport. And then there's combustion of the gas at the gas plant to generate electricity. And that combustion is not captured. So you have more air pollution, more carbon dioxide from the natural gas plant. They only captured over three years, 65% of the CO2 from the coal plant. And what did they do with that CO2? Well, they built a pipeline and piped it to a nearby oil field where the CO2 was then put into the oil field where it could bind with the oil so that it make the oil less dense so you can get the oil come out faster and then you burn more oil. Well, 40% of the CO2 that is captured goes right back to the air. So we did an analysis of that, that whole process, actually not even including enhanced oil recovery, just up to the point of capture. And we found that because of the all the emissions from the gas plant and the upstream emissions of the coal mining and the low capture efficiency, that only between 11 and 20% of the CO2 that was emitted overall with the system was actually captured before enhanced oil recovery. When you count for enhanced oil recovery, where 40% of what is captured is lost, then we're talking about a 7 to 12% capture rate, which is ridiculous as a proposal to solve climate change. This was so inefficient, it was shut down after three years. It cost $1 billion. Who paid for that? Well, it's low-income ratepayers because they pay the highest fraction of their income for electricity. So this is just a boondoggle. So carbon capture, that is one type of capture. The other type is called direct air capture, where similar technologies are used just to extract carbon dioxide from the air directly. Well, trees do that too, but trees do not require equipment or energy. They do it naturally. The problem with direct air capture is it also requires energy, similar to carbon capture, but it requires even more energy because carbon dioxide in the air is very dilute compared to an exhaust stream. So direct air capture has the same problems as carbon capture, they both increase air pollution. Oh, by the way, even if you ran the carbon capture equipment with wind, and this is what we looked at in this Petronova plant, if you even run the carbon capture with wind, if you use that wind instead just to replace the coal, you would reduce more carbon than if you use the wind to run the carbon capture equipment. The same thing with direct air capture. Even in the best case of using winds to power direct air capture equipment, you would reduce more carbon dioxide by taking that wind and replacing a fossil fuel source. So in other words, direct air capture and carbon capture always increase carbon dioxide, even in the best case of using renewable electricity to power them, compared with using that renewable electricity to replace a fossil source. So carbon capture, direct air capture increase CO2, they increase air pollution, they increase fossil fuel mining, and they increase fossil fuel infrastructure because you need more mining to run the carbon capture equipment. You need more infrastructure for the carbon capture equipment and the energy for it. And they also increase costs. So there's no benefit whatsoever. They're only designed to keep the fossil fuel industry in business. Blue hydrogen is just producing hydrogen from natural gas with carbon capture. So it has the same problems. Electrofuels is producing fuels to replace gasoline and diesel and jet fuel with synthetic fuels that are made from carbon dioxide from carbon capture. So they face the same problem. So None of those technologies is useful going forward. They are wastes and delay tactics, and they do not help us solve the climate or air pollution or energy security problems we face. 
Wow, yeah. I'm curious if you have thoughts about the greening of the economy beyond the energy system. There's a few proposals that we've heard about and talked about on the show over the last couple of years that come to mind. One of them is rewilding land as having effects on carbon capture. Eliminating factory farming is another one proposed by one of our guests. And one of the things that we've talked about a lot is the creation of sort of like large scale commons systems of, say, the library style management of public goods. Do you have any thoughts or insights on how these might have positive climate impacts or whether there's issues with them? Well, so we're against what we call synthetic carbon capture and direct air capture, where you need equipment and energy. But we are for natural carbon capture, in other words, trees. So that includes not only reforestation, growing more trees, but reducing deforestation. Even That's even more important is reducing deforestation because deforestation is done by burning a forest. And that produces not only carbon dioxide, but also all the other pollutants, unfiltered other pollutants that cause health problems. So reducing deforestation is a significant way, permanent deforestation. And permanent deforestation is when they, you burn down a forest, for example, a rainforest, and you replace it with agricultural land. So you're taking high carbon intense land and converting it to low carbon intense land. And if we can eliminate a lot of that, that will save a lot of carbon dioxide, but also eliminate a lot of air pollution. So we're for reducing deforestation, increasing reforestation. Now, agricultural emissions, agriculture is responsible for a lot of emissions of greenhouse gases and pollutants. Now, a good portion of those emissions are associated with energy. And so we, in our plans, we would eliminate the energy associated emissions from agriculture right away. But there are other emissions from agriculture that are not energy related, including methane emissions from like rice paddies, for example, the digestive tracts of sheep and cattle, and also not agriculture related, but uh, landfills, you get methane emissions. Because any environment where there's a lack of oxygen, you get what are called methanogenic bacteria that produce methane. And also in manure, there's methane emissions from that. So we need to address non-energy emissions simultaneously with energy emissions. Well, there's also nitrous oxide from fertilizers too, is another source. So there are techniques to try to reduce the methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture that need to be implemented as well. I mean, one, for example, is from manure, a digester, uh, where you dry out the manure and then you swirl it around in a digester to uh, release the methane, and then the methane is captured in a bag. Well, but you have to do something with that methane. Now, that's biogenic methane, what we call biogenic methane. And you can get methane also from landfills by putting pipes in landfills and capturing it in the same way. But what do you do with all this extra methane? Because we don't want to just release it to the air. Well, one thing to, that can be done is, is to use it to produce hydrogen by a process called steam methane reforming. Uh, which is already used worldwide. So steam methane reforming already exists, but just use that biogenic methane to produce hydrogen. And the only byproducts of that are carbon dioxide and trivial amounts of chemicals. Then you have hydrogen that can be used in a fuel cell for energy without any emissions. And the CO2 at that point probably could be released to the air, even though it's not going to be a large amount, but it's better to release CO2 to the air than methane. We don't want to take that CO2 and then try to use carbon capture equipment or pipelines to pipe it, because then that just defeats the purpose of building pipelines for CO2. But that's another problem with carbon capture. You need pipelines for it. But that it's better to release CO2 than methane, because methane on a 20-year time scale is about 86 times the global warming potential of CO2. So that would be one thing to do with methane from agriculture. But there are other niche sources of emissions that need to be addressed as well, like cement production, where half the emissions are from energy, which can be addressed through renewable energy, but the other half are what are called process emissions of CO2, because you have calcium carbonate goes into cement production. But a simple solution, there's a company called um, Brimstone that does this. They just substitute basalt, which is a rock similar to calcium carbonate, but it doesn't have any carbonate in it, but it has calcium. So you can just substitute basalt or calcite, and you eliminate your process emissions of CO2. So that's one way to address cement. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Climate Anger Corner, where Sean and Aaron talk about this one study that we uh, looked at, the strength and content of climate anger, which came out last year in 2023, about how anger affects people's perceptions and actions towards climate change. 
in our anger episode, we were talking about anger as an effective motivating force. And so I was just thinking about climate anger and was there any research on it and Googled it, found this study. It's pretty interesting. They broke down the different emotions people expressed in these interviews about climate change. And then they also broke down the different types of actions and behaviors that they participated in by the types of emotions expressed and then which behaviors they contributed to or not. And there was some really interesting interesting stuff in there. The three types of behaviors that they measured were individual behavior, doing things like trying to take shorter showers or using less fuel personally or trying to carpool, just anything where you're like doing like individual behavior. Support for policy was the second type of action that they measured. And then engaging in activism was the third type of action. So for anger specifically, they found that anger is not really associated with people doing individual behaviors to try and mitigate climate change, but it is associated with policy support for climate change related policies. And it's like really, really associated with engaging in activism. Out of all the emotions they have here, anger, sadness, fear, guilt, and hope, anger blew all the other emotions out of the water in terms of motivating people to engage in activism specifically. So that really kind of like matched our uh, instinct on that, on like anger being a motivating for it doesn't seem to motivate people for everything, at least according to this one study. But in terms of activism specifically, uh, it's like a huge motivating factor, like more than twice as much as the next highest one, which was fear. Yeah. And looking at, at these stats here and how they compare, it, it is interesting. Fear and guilt are both pretty significantly associated with supporting policy actions. But fear is more associated with individual behavior, like shorter showers, recycling, etc., where guilt and anger have very, very low correlations with individual behaviors, which is weird because guilt, you'd think guilt would motivate individual behaviors, but it, it appears not. Yeah, no, that was an interesting one. Yeah, that for individual behaviors, sadness and fear were the top ones, and hope is also pretty close. And then guilt and anger are like basically nothing not really associated with it and and hope is pretty good for individual behavior and policy support it's like a nice solid correlation but it's significantly less connected with activism yeah it's so, actually the worst one out of all five of those emotions for activism yeah it, it kind of makes sense in the way of like sometimes hope can be like a pacifying kind right. of like oh people are going to figure it out kind of vibe so it looks like a combo between hope and anger might be one of the more potent mixes here, maybe a tinge of fear as well. But yeah, either hope and anger or anger and fear, anger and one of the other ones, like even anger and sadness would be pretty good. Yeah, it looks, it looks complimentary. Sadness is really good for individual behavior for some reason. But yeah, we'll have a link in the, the description to our show notes for the study so you can look at this stuff in more detail. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting to look at this survey out of Norway showing that the association between anger and activism blows every other association in this study out of the water. We're talking about a difference of almost twice as effective. Like anger is almost twice as effective as the second most pertinent correlation, which is fear and policy support. And anger is also really good for policy support, not quite as good as fear. But the other interesting thing they did in this study was break down the reasons people are angry about climate change. So the most people who are angry about climate change said that their anger came because of human actions. They're angry at the actions people are taking. The second highest reason people were angry was being angry at specific agents, like anger directed towards the people who are doing these actions. So it's a higher percent of people are angry about the actions than people who are angry specifically at people. But that's the second highest one. And then when you break down the specific people that they're angry at, that was when I saw some really interesting things like the highest percentage there is politicians. And then the lowest percentage there is the rich or industry. Those are like two and five percent, whereas politicians is 22 percent. And like, I kind of get it. Like politicians are the ones making the policy decisions. They're like the final say on that. But like part of me is like, no, you're like you're getting it. The reason those politicians are making those decisions is because of industry and the rich. Yeah, no, I think it shows that there's room for and I would assume that this finding in Norway holds up elsewhere, that there's room for public 
public education and engagement on this stuff because it's no great secret that there's this widespread misconception that climate change is caused by people in general doing bad things and it's something right. that people should feel guilty about or misanthropic about but a more careful analysis of what's happening in the world shows that the disproportionate power and resource uses of the wealthy and industry and their relationship with politics is the driver of climate change. And that's like a, a social ecological kind of insight that we could do more to engage people to understand because I'm hesitant to say, you know, they're wrong about what they're angry about, but 2% are saying that they're angry at the rich over climate change. And what is it like? 22 percent in politics or i don't know which yeah i was thinking about uh the the human qualities yeah human qualities is yeah just below it. people mad at agents and like the broader thing or broader things they're mad about human qualities so like yeah just so thinking 26 like, percent of people suck. are mad at human nature and two percent are mad at the, the rich. rich and powerful um, which yeah. is just, it's wrong. It's a bad analysis. Yeah, I wonder if some of the people who are not mad at industry or the rich but are mad at politicians are like that because they have low expectations for industry and the rich. I, I feel like I almost feel that a little bit where I'm like, oh, yeah, the rich and industry are going to you know, rapaciously destroy the planet for profit. Of course, that's what they're going to do. Can't even be mad at them about it. They're like rabid dogs just doing that. But politicians, they're the ones who are supposed to be stopping them and they're not stopping them. So I can almost connect with it in that way. But they're not rabid dogs who are just doing it. They're human beings who are making decisions. So like, I think it's kind of letting them off the hook uh, to think that way. I'm open to a general critique of politicians, and we've made general critiques of politicians on the show. But one of the things that I don't like about that is like it's very specific groups of politicians that are the worst offenders. Like different politicians are offenders at different levels. Right. And it might be a limitation of the survey, but the correlation and connections between the politicians and the industry is where the really sort of you know, demonic stuff comes out, for lack of a better term. Yeah. So quickly, some of the other ones, about 13% of people are angry about consequences for nature. 11% are angry about consequences for humans. 10% are angry about money, which reading the study, I think, is talking about valuing money over the environment, over other concerns, like the, the sort of profit-seeking mentality. 6% are angry about climate denial, and 3% are angry about not having control over the situation. All reasonable things to express anger about. And I also, I just want to mention, from what I understand, this wasn't like a survey where they were like, check off the things that make you angry and only a certain amount of people. They were just interviewing people. And then afterwards, they coded the interviews to be like, what did people spontaneously bring up themselves when talking about their feelings about climate change and whatnot? Right, right. So they could be, they could be angry about more of these things than just not... They they, they don't, they just, don't think it just to wasn't top the, of mind for them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, having one in 10 people say that they're angry about people putting money ahead of the planet actually isn't, yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that only 10% of them care about that. It's only 10% of them have it top of mind. Yeah. It's not that the other 90% were like, oh yeah, no, that's fine. Not angry about that at all. And then, yeah, they also correlated these different reasons for being angry with those other behavioral things, again, individual policy support and activism. And in terms of that, the best thing for activism is people who are angry about valuing money over the environment, people who are angry about climate denial, people who are angry about lack of control are the most likely people to engage in activism. Uh, also, people who are blaming human qualities were up there too. Um, but I found it interesting that the three best things for activism, money, denial, and lack of control, were also the three lowest on the list of the amount of people who were angry about those things. It was kind of interesting but sad. What it means is that activists are very likely to bring those things up if you ask them an open-ended question about what they're angry about. Yeah, I guess that makes sense for sure, yeah. Because it's not necessarily causation if we're tracking a correlation. Right, right, right. It's not that being angry about those things causes activism necessarily. It could be that, yeah, activists end up thinking about those things more frequently. It also makes an activism maybe causes you to start having some doubts about human qualities, human nature. And maybe that's why, like, you know, you've been doing activism for a while. You're getting fucking jaded about all these people who aren't listening to you. Maybe that's why <laughs> they express anger about that. Which, again, is not what I would advise and, you know, we, you can listen to our show to hear more about our thoughts on that. But it's interesting anyway. So we'll have a link in the show notes to this if you want to check out the study. The Strength and Content of Climate Anger in the Journal of Global Environmental Change. Very interesting study. Yeah, yeah check it out. 
And now it's time for the old two meeting sketch. Mr. Senator, sir, there's a meeting here. Uh, a constituent wants to... Oh, uh, is it time for that already? Uh, wants to talk uh, about energy transition? <sighs> yeah, I guess send him in. Hi, Mr. Senator. Thanks. Oh, hi. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. We really, really appreciate Thank you for having from you. me. So, yeah, I guess the quick pitch is that I've been reading some stuff, some oh, work reading. by Mark C. Great. Jacobson and others, mm-hmm. about doing mm-hmm. a energy transition to 100% wind, water, solar oh, energy. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's a wow. bunch of benefits. Yeah, we're looking into that, yeah. Yeah, there's benefits mm-hmm. uh, on, like, my kid has asthma. Asthma is caused by particulates oh. in the atmosphere, caused oh, by, no. well, not entirely caused, by significantly contributed to. Oh, by I'm this. so sorry to hear that. That's awful. Well, thank you. But so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the future kids, too. And a wind, water, solar transition, you know, you save money on health care costs. It actually pays for itself over time. And we have to, in the end, we actually have to use less energy because so much energy is being used to extract fossil fuels and get them to the right places, burn, combust them. Not to mention the cost of some of these techno solutions people talk about, like carbon capture and storage. That all requires energy. So the the energy costs of using oil are actually really much larger than they seem. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And wind, water, solar, it's already being done in parts around the world. And we could transition the whole world to it. And we'd save a lot of lives. And we'd have a, a cleaner, better environment for everyone. And yeah, so I was just hoping that you would support this and sort of a Green New Deal type plan well let me just say first of all that i love the way you think i love what you're saying it's so refreshing just to hear you know new ideas and new plans like this a lot of these a lot of these ideas aren't even that new they they first proposed the outline of this in 2008 Mm. right well yeah and the other thing i wanted to say is that children and especially future children are the future and it's so stirring and moving to me to hear about your struggles with your child's asthma and to think about the struggles of future children. And, you know, it's just thank you again so much. I can't stress enough how much I'm thanking you for coming to me with this and for talking to us with this. The one thing I will say is that there's a lot of barriers in place as to how quickly and how fast we can do it. I'm on board 100 percent. But it's going to take time. There's a lot of committees. There's a lot of red tape. Oil field workers, they have children too. And so we got to think about their livelihood. Don't want to, you know, have all their kids out on the street. So, yeah, we're on board with what you're saying 100%. We just want to manage expectations uh, as to how quickly all this can happen. And, you know, some things are under our jurisdiction, some things are under the jurisdiction of the federal government or, you know, there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot of complex moving parts in this machine. But I just want you to know that we hear you most and foremost. And we thank you. We hear you and we thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, it looks so, like I, guess, I got time. I got another meeting coming right up, so I'm just gonna have to rush you kind of out the door. Sure. Sorry, and just to be clear, was there a com- did you commit to push uh, for this kind of stuff? I've or? committed to hearing you, which I've done, and I will relay what you, you said. said. I'm committing to relaying what you said to the relevant people to hopefully get the ball rolling. I, I thought you on said that, that you were 100 percent behind me. That doesn't. I sound am 100 like percent behind you, and I'm you're not I've committed to trying to start the process of getting the ball rolling rolling on beginning to look at not, what you're saying like that's not really a hundred percent that's like maybe 51 percent or well, that's something. no that's a hundred percent that's that's a hundred percent so uh well thank you again and goodbye and just to be clear you're a progressive politician yeah oh yeah of course uh mr senator we've got your three o'clock meeting oh yeah please send them in my big oil ceo friend that'll be refreshing after that last one there Hey, asshole, how you doing? <laughs> hey, you old bastard. Come in, sit down. You're going to wipe that off your drink? lip. You got a little poo-poo on your lip. Hey, come on now. That's, that's... kissing asses all day. I'm just kidding, <laughs> but hey, put her there. That guy's kid was sick. Oh, yeah, you heard that? You heard about yeah, that? Yeah, no, the yeah. kid was out there. He's coughing up a storm. Oh, the kid was out there. Yeesh. Well, I'm glad he didn't bring the kid in. That would have been sad to look at. Sorry you had to deal with that in the waiting room, but. Well, thank you. Well, you can make it up to me, bud. <laughs> you can I always make it try up to, to me. I always try to. So, yeah, the, how's the oil and gas industry going? Gr- boom, oh, business booming? Tough time or, for oh, us. A lot of these. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, 
well, I'm just going to put it straight, ideological terrorists, mm -hmm. people who want nothing more than to destroy me, my children. Well, that, that's what I was trying to explain to the last person. Like, you have children, too. Yeah, uh, as a I CEO do. Many of, children. Yeah. With many, many, many partners all around the world. Let's just say I get around. But yeah, so as I was saying, tough. It's a really hard time for us right now with this, you know, green dream <laughs> crap. Excuse my French. Pardon my... Francais, but like, you know, I'm committed to green. I'm a progressive politician, but you got to be realistic sometimes. So listen, I'm not going to bite your ear off here today. I just, a bill's going through the Senate right now. Some new subsidies. It's shit you'll love. It's green oil and gas subsidies. Nice. Green oil and gas. That's now that's something I can really work with. So yeah, we can get these squawking birds off of our back long enough that we can keep pumping and pumping and pumping it out of the ground and burning but and in burning and burning. Yes. Green pumping, green burning. So how does that work? How is the green pumping and the green burning? If someone asked me to explain it, do you have like an elevator pitch? Like how do you... The first thing that we're going to do is we're hiring a graphic designer. So uh, graphic designers will have a lot of green in their palette. And I don't know if you've seen the color spectrum, but there's actually quite a bit of green in it. Those color wizards, they can put green on anything so we want an icon that's sort of like a leaf a little green leaf oh yeah and then so kind of put it up by your logo or like yeah, next so to our a logo, refinery or uh, you know petro extraction burning for energy llc we're gonna color that one green mm -hmm. and then we're gonna get a little leaf next to it and it'll be a lighter green so you need some subsidies to help pay for all those graphic designers I mean, graphic designers these days i don't yeah. know you know it's they expensive. don't do it for exposure anymore believe you me right and then we're going to be if you're at a fracking yeah so fracking is like another type of gas and it's greener in the sense that it's I can't remember how it's greener, but just trust. There's like fewer CO2, I think. Something like that. Yeah. But if you do it enough, it's the same. And then also we have to put the undisclosed chemicals underground to break things up down there. Oh yeah, you just don't mention that. It's undisclosed for a reason. That's what I always... Like, let sleeping dogs lie. Let undisclosed chemicals remain undisclosed. That's my philosophy. Um, so I hope that answers all your questions. Yeah, no, that's totally, that makes so sense, we just, Green. And it's important for the economy. You guys are the backbone of the economy. Right. And as much as I well, how can would you have love a, to transition to fully renewables eventually. How can you have a transition without an economy? That's the thing. <laughs> exactly. You, you talk to these green, green dream numbskulls, <laughs> these nutbags, and they're, they'll, they'll tell just you. Trust me, I talk to them all the time. And they're like, oh my god, my kid's got asthma. Oh, won't somebody help me? Yeah, well, would you like it better if your kid was living through the depression and they were like right. little puffs of dust come out when they turn their pockets inside out? And they, they don't even care about the birds that are hitting these spinning towers. Oh, yeah, the birds hitting the windmills. It's all over the place. It's and like, something. If you've seen solar panels on roofs, it just it doesn't look as good as a shingle. I'll tell you that. It's kind of ugly. It's kind of creepy looking. Half these guys are flying around on planes and they're yeah, going they're, to the climate conference right, buying right. new shirts there's like uh excuse me i thought you said we're in a climate crisis why'd you buy a new shirt are you an insane person do you wash all your clothes in the tub and don't use your washing machine to help save energy no you're still using toilet paper well isn't your hand just as good with no environmental impact yeah you could just rinse it off in the toilet water after yeah just on the other side of the toilet from where the excretion was or just up in the tank, even. In the if tank. You want. Oh, yeah. that's. See, you got to be designing this green stuff. Because you're a pragmatist. And that's why I always like coming through here. Well, I'm not saying I would do that. I'm saying if you don't do that and then you come and criticize the oil and gas industry, it doesn't really make sense to me anyway. I don't know. Yeah. Well, this has been an extremely productive meeting. I'm so happy to hear you guys are going well, thank green. Thank you. With that new color palette. That's just great. So, yeah, I will try to get those subsidies expedited as quickly as possible. No, sorry. I'm not going to try to get those subsidies expedited as quickly as possible. Thank you. I will please. get those subsidies expedited immediately. That's my top priority. I'm behind it 10,000%. It's going to happen. Can you jump for me? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, any particular height you'd like me to jump to? Yeah, about four and a half inches. Four and a half. Oh, yeah, that's easy. I jumped that high. Any time for you. There you go. Is that enough? You want me to keep doing it? Keep doing it, but I gotta go. Hey, right, bye. Thanks for stopping I by. I hope you're jumping the next time I stop in here, you son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll be jumping the whole time. Uh, you crazy bastard. I love you. Love you, too. See you at the ranch. And that was the old two meetings sketch. 
on the subject of money, is transitioning to an electrified system, wind, water, solar, is that an expensive undertaking? How does that fit into the economic system? And when this is being pitched to governments and stuff like that, they're going to look at their budgets on a year to year basis, even more than they look at the, the, the sort of sustainable biosphere of the planet and so on, it appears. So what's the economics of this sort of plan? Well, we calculate that worldwide, it would cost on the order of a little over $60 trillion. Sounds like a lot. But if we look at it from an annual cost point of view, I mean, right now, the world spends about $11 trillion per year on energy. By 2050, that's expected to go up to about $17 trillion or so per year. And by the way, on top of that, then you have health costs. So the 7.5 million air pollution deaths per year, that's about $30 trillion per year in cost in terms of what's called the value of statistical life. And that's a parameter that governments set. What do, they, what do they value people's lives at? It's about each person's life, depending on the country, You know, could be anywhere from $3 million to $15 million a person. But average worldwide, when you account for the death rates due to air pollution, we're talking about $30 trillion per year. And climate costs, based on the social cost of carbon anticipated in 2050, are also another $30 trillion per year. So if you look at the 2050 energy cost in a business as usual scenario with fossil fuels of $17 trillion per year, plus another $60 trillion per year for health and climate costs, that's about $77 trillion per year. Well, wind, water, solar eliminates health and climate costs. So it eliminates $60 trillion right there. And it reduces energy demand by about 56%, but it also reduces the cost per unit energy by another 15%. So we're, it's about a 63% lower annual cost of energy. So instead of $17 trillion per year, we're down to about $7 trillion per year. So it's $10 trillion per year difference in energy costs. So just ignore the health and climate costs. There's $10 trillion per year difference in the energy costs. If the total cost is $60 trillion up front, divide that by $10 trillion per year savings. It's a payback time of six years. We can transition the entire world for all purposes and get a payback in six years of the energy costs alone. When we account for the health and climate cost benefits, we're talking a payback time of less than one year because we basically, instead of $77 trillion per year in energy plus health plus climate costs in a fossil fuel case, we have a $7 trillion per year total. So that's $70 trillion per year savings. That means $60 trillion upfront cost, $70 trillion per year savings. That's less than a one year payback time with wind, water, solar. So it's just the most obvious thing to do in terms of saving money in terms of not only direct consumer cost savings, but also health cost savings, climate cost savings, in addition to job creation and reducing land use and also providing clean renewable energy in perpetuity. So wind, water, solar looks superior to alternative energy options based on this discussion and reading the book. But are, are there like negative externalities? Like, for example, I know that when large scale water plants are installed, often there's large amounts of land that are flooded. Cultural or environmental impacts could be part of these like large scale dams. Another thing that's frequently brought up is the intermittency of solar and wind power. Just in the interest of providing a full picture on the genuine challenges that we face, like what do you think are the biggest challenges to these energy systems? It's sort of like negative externalities that we need to find ways to overcome. And, and to what degree do we know how to overcome them? Well, ideally, we would not add anything to the environment, no wind turbines, solar panels, hydro dams, or batteries or anything. But we do have to provide our energy somehow. So we want to take the least invasive technologies and least cost and least polluting. And that's wind, water, solar is that. Now, in terms of hydropower, our plans involve no new large hydro dams. We use existing hydro dams exclusively. And so that is not an issue going forward. But there are issues like, yeah, the wind does not always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. So that's why we need to combine storage with generation. So battery storage, hydroelectric. The nice thing about existing hydro dams is they provide electricity storage. They're, in fact, the largest source of storage in the world. And the second largest existing electricity storage in the world today is pumped hydro storage. And then batteries, though, are growing in popularity and will probably overtake the other two worldwide at some point. So storage, but also what's called demand response. So there's the supply of energy, but there's also the demand for energy. If we can shift the time of the demand for energy by minutes to hours, 
then you can actually match the intermittent supply better. You know, solar peaks during the day, obviously, but if you can shift the nighttime electricity use toward the daytime, when you have a lot of solar on the grid, that's called demand response. Or in other cases, like right now, most demand for electricity is in the late afternoon, early evening, and that's when electricity prices are highest. But so if you can shift the demand to later at night, so let's say we have a lot of electric vehicles, instead of charging them in the late afternoon, what if we give people incentives to charge them late at night? And then you can actually match demand with supply better and lower the cost of energy. And also over generation, sometimes it's better just to build more wind and solar than we need to provide extra energy that can either be stored or used or converted to heat or converted to hydrogen. Like electrification of all energy sectors makes the problem easier to solve because we have more of what are called flexible demands. Like producing hydrogen, we don't need to produce hydrogen at the same time it's used. We can produce the hydrogen and then store it. So when you have extra electricity, you can use some of that extra electricity to produce hydrogen. You can use some of that extra electricity to produce heat. The heat can be stored in water or underground. And that's the cases where you have extra electricity. And then, then some of that extra electricity will be stored in electrical storage. And then when we don't have enough electricity, well, then that's when we come from electricity storage to use that. We have interconnections with other regions, so grid interconnections. So we import more electricity from other regions. And we use demand response to try to shift the time of electricity use. Well, anyway, we found that with all these techniques, we can solve the problem every 30 seconds for multiple years, everywhere worldwide. We've looked at 149 countries now and have no problem keeping the grid stable continuously. You mentioned before 2023 is the hottest year on record globally. So it's clear we're facing a very urgent crisis on the climate front, you know, and how many million is it die per year because of the pollution impacts? Uh, almost seven and a half million people. Seven, per year. Yeah, geez, that's a lot of human beings. Your original, the article in Scientific American was 2009. So if a baby was born when it was published, they'd be almost graduating college now, or maybe graduating college. <laughs> That'd be pretty smart. <laughs> They're closer to 15 years old. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I get my math wrong? Oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> if a baby was born, then they <laughs> they would be in high school now, or they're some sort of genius, some sort of highly advanced genius. Like I said, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> with your experience with having this time pass and interacting also with policymakers and stuff like that, and there's the entrenched power of the fossil fuel industry, and there's sort of the political inertia dragging feet from one term to the next and so on. Do you have any political takeaways on the challenge of the political will? Because you, you mentioned that there isn't a technological issue, there isn't an economic issue, there's just a political issue. And we could be a lot further along by now if there was less of those political issues. And you ever worry, for example, we're going to be, you know, another 15 years from now, and we're going to be looking back on all the things that could have been done that haven't been done. And we're halfway through building a bunch of nuclear plants or something. And like, yeah, so any any reflections on the political process, the political inertia and, and those challenges? Well, I think the biggest problem we're facing is the competition among ideas. There's a policy that goes back to the Obama administration called an all of the above policy. Let's just try everything and hope something works. And this is really what's led to the pushing of nuclear carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuels, bioenergy, even solar radiation management, which is geoengineering. You know, we've evaluated all these technologies and find that they're not helpful at all. In fact, they're harmful for trying to solve the problem. Yet, in the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, about 40% of the funding goes for these useless endeavors. And so this is the big danger we face because, in fact, in the last COP meeting, several countries pledged to triple the amount of nuclear power. So they're going to spend a lot of money trying to increase nuclear power worldwide. But this will never happen. I mean, the economics are so bad and the time lags are so bad that you can have all the goals in the world, but you'll never get much nuclear put up even in the next 15 to 20 years. And we need to solve 80% of the problem in six years. So it's going to be useless, but they're going to put a huge amount of money in and waste that money, prevent that money from actually being used to deploy much faster deploying solutions that are much cheaper. And so that's what's slowing us down. It's just a distraction. We're being distracted by technologies that are not helpful at all for solving the problem. Again, they're nuclear power, small or large, 
carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuels, bioenergy, geoengineering. These are not useful technologies at all. And they're harmful for actually solving air pollution, climate change, and energy security problems we face. Yeah, fascinating. Well, this was an awesome interview. I've learned a lot here between reading your book and this discussion. I really appreciate you coming on. For our audience, any any closing thoughts on this transition we have ahead of us and what people should be looking to and thinking about? Well, I want to end on an optimistic note. I think we have 95% of the technologies we need, and most of these technologies are really highly commercial and, and low cost and can be deployed right away. And we can solve the problem. The numbers show that we can solve these problems at low cost, create jobs, save consumers money, reduce health and environmental damage, and reduce land use even. We just need to focus on what works, keep our eye on the ball, deploy, deploy, deploy as fast as possible, not get distracted by things that don't work. And so I would just stay positive and suggest people stay positive and just focus on the ball. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much again. And yeah, I don't know why I, I added a, I carried a one there when I was thinking about this hypothetical baby that just was never there in the first place. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to keep that in. You know, it's important to let the listeners know that even podcast hosts aren't perfect. I did that too when I was adding up the the present day plus how long a nuclear reactor took place. Like, <laughs> we're all human. <laughs> Awesome. So the book is No Miracles Needed, very readable and very in-depth book. There's a lot of things covered that we didn't talk about. Uh, I'd have time to talk about. So definitely go check that out. Yeah. And thanks again. It was a great pleasure to speak to you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Look forward to the final result. Yeah. So there you have it. Our interview with Mark C. Jacobson. Looks like a better world uh, is possible. Not only possible, but we got a plan. Yeah. We know it's possible because it's already happening. Not at the rate that we need, not as much as we need. And then also there's the political interference of the oil and gas industry. You know, Mark handled the hope. Let's get into the anger. Now, as you might know, 2024 is the year of righteous, positive, utopian anger at Seriously Wrong. Last year was the year of the bonus episode. Each year we try to get some sort of abstract theme. <laughs> you know, anger has a real purpose in politics. It incites people to action. I got angry about the industrial accident in Vancouver and myself and some friends, we got a letter writing campaign going. That's anger working for you. Yeah, anger is self-protective. It causes you to take actions to stop the thing that is making you be like, no, I don't like this. It's making me angry. That's kind of the point of the emotion. Yeah, and there can be too much and it can be maladaptive in certain circumstances uh, yeah, yeah, or there sure. can be secondary effects that you need to sort of keep under wraps or moderate. But I think when it comes to the oil and gas industry, we should be angry. So I'll go a little further than Professor Stanford Professor Mark C. Jacobson on this. I am really fucking angry at the oil oil and gas industry killing people with impunity for decades and destroying and baking our planet, burning the planet up, destroying our home, destroying nature, destroying the biodiversity of our planet, destroying ecosystems, forests, jungles, the oceans. I think we really need something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission on climate, and we need to hold these firms accountable. We need to seize their assets and their beneficiaries' assets to some great degree. Maybe I'm just pissed off, but I think the oil and gas industry is killing us. And then they're putting little Facebook ads in my feed or whatever, like, oh, we're doing clean oil now. This is our green. <laughs> we put a little green leaf next to it and we use combustion based energy and we put a little green leaf next to it and your child will choke and get asthma. Isn't it nice? Green choking. Green asthma. And yeah, 2023 was the hottest year on record. 2024 is not going to be, uh, you know, major reverse of the trends. It's time to get a little angry, you know? Not everything's doe-eyed. Not everything's always positive. Not, not Everything's not always going to work out in the end. Sometimes you got to, like, go, yeah, no, ah! <laughs> Within reason, of course. Like, you shouldn't treat other people that way. But institutions... We should be furious with. I don't know. Maybe I'm overdoing this anger riff. I actually don't feel like angry right now. I could work myself up by talking about it, but I actually feel all right. Yeah, maybe you just want to do like sort of a little bit of a wrap up spiel and then I'll. What, what do you mean a wrap up spiel? Like, like this is the end of the episode. Thanks again to our patrons. We'll be back soon. Thank you so much for everybody for listening uh, this week. Thank you to Mark C. Jacobson for coming on, doing this great interview. Hearing this now, I'm starting to think maybe it shouldn't be the year of anger. Maybe it should be the year of gratitude because that gratitude was so powerful. Uh, well, you can be both. You can be grateful and angry at the same time. So our year of both anger and gratitude. <laughs>
two great tastes that go great together. Yeah, that's <laughs> the like new peanut butter and pepper, chocolate. It's, yeah, vanilla ice cream and olive oil. Have you had that? I saw no. someone post a picture of it. Yeah, I saw. I haven't tried it, but it seems I saw intuitively it also like on, not a thing. But I don't know. It seems good to me. I don't know. I would try it. I mean, I like both of them. Yeah. They also mentioned salt, salting it, and I like salting sweet things in general. Oh, yeah. It makes it sweeter, they say. That's an old baking trick. It also makes it slightly salty, which is good. <laughs> well, yeah, it depends how much you eat. <laughs> but, like, you get those, like, salted caramel cookies with, like, the little chunks flake of salt, of salt yeah. on the top, and you get that little burst of salty yum, yum, taste. Yum. I've yeah, got gratitude great. for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got anger to the people who take it from me. <laughs> But actually, anger and gratitude, you know, it is kind of a nice pairing. It does, it, they balance each other out a little bit. The right anger at the right time for the right reasons, the right gratitude at the right time for the right reasons. It's kind of mm. everything yeah. in balance. Absolutely, yeah. It's all emotions, baby. You need all of them. Oh, well, sound off on the comments, people. What do you think about Mark Z. Jacobson's wind water solar plan? And what do you feel angry about? And what do you feel gratitude for? Tell us all three in one post. <laughs> You have one, two, three. One, this is what I think of the plan. Two, this is what I'm angry about. Three, this is what I'm grateful for. And do you have any sort of hybrid gratitude anger stories that you can share with us? Hideo Kojima, the guy who created Metal Gear Solid and Death Stranding, he said that great art is art that makes you feel two things at once. So maybe this week's episode was great art if it made you angry and gracious. Well, I mean, if you're angry at the fossil fuel industry for poisoning the air, but grateful to Mark Z. Jacobson for doing all this work, thinking about what the solutions are and like doing the research, breaking the numbers down, that's, you know, makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's to like me. a sweet cookie with little pieces of salt in it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm not sure if I can stay angry that long, but we'll try again next week. Oh, for a whole year? <laughs> for a whole year of just pure anger. Well, I did, you don't have to own, like, we didn't only do bonus episodes the year of the bonus episode. You can do, like. True. Yeah. I'm grateful for that insight. And I'm angry I didn't come up with it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We will see you again next time and if you didn't listen girl, i'm mad at <laughs> you just skipped right to the end uh yeah yeah i guess they won't hear it you're right i always listen to the last 20 seconds of a podcast and that's it so if i refuse to listen to it i just want to hop right there <laughs>